You are now tuning in to the Going North Podcast with your host, best-selling author, professional speaker, and member of the John Maxwell team, Dominic Dom Brightman. And every Monday and Thursday, we're going to hear the voice of a different author sharing their gifts, stories, and expertise to help you charge forward in life. Now let's get on with the show. And today on the Going North podcast, we bring you some super special, awesome humans from across the globe. Today is another one of those occasions. And today is an extra special occasion because, my goodness, I say legendary every now and then for guests on the show, but this is actually the first one on the show that actually has legendary on his one sheet because this wonderful gentleman right here, acclaimed author, speaker, and expert on total sexy health. And he has an eight-step process that takes into consideration all the elements of whole health that includes our mental health, presence, and awareness, as well as our life energy and being in harmony with nature and humanity. He's given over 5,000, you heard that right, folks, over 5,000 live presentations on nutrition and health, 3,000 plus media interviews, 1,500 staff trainings, and traveled to 30 plus countries with his message on oil, health, nature, and human nature. And on top of that, he's a best selling author of 250,000 copies sold of numerous books, including Fats That Heal, Fats That Kill, that was published back in 93. And this success stems from his rough upbringing of growing up in a war zone, living without water, electricity. And in 1980, he got a pesticide poisoning and his doctors didn't know what to do with him. So he decided to take his health into his own hands. And through that deep research, he made discoveries that changed the trajectory of his life purpose. And he has one heck of a purpose indeed because he is a teacher at Tony Robbins Live Events on Oils and Deepak Chopra's On Peace and is keynoted at multiple conferences including international brain health and lectured at conferences in over five continents so let's give it up for this man with more wisdom than the book of proverbs itself mr <laughs> udo erasmus how you doing today sir hey, doing very well i don't know if i have more wisdom than the book of proverbs but it's possible <laughs> it's possible because it, the book of proverbs is limited right and that wisdom came from within people so there may be, there may, it's possible. Anyway, nice, nice introduction. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Indeed. My pleasure. Indeed. That wasn't even all of it, but definitely had to give you your kudos and your props because it's well-deserved. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Even had a mini podcast sir, before the actual recording podcast too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So with all of that amass knowledge and experience, I have, I have to wonder, like, what keeps you going, to be honest, Dr. Udo? What keeps you going? You know, I, I got really inspired when I got poisoned and I started reading about health and discovered how much damage is done to the oils that we use in our foods by the industry and then by the cooking and that they are the most sensitive of all of our nutrients and should get the most care, but we give them the least care. And that 99% of the population doesn't get enough of one of the essential fatty acids called an omega-3, and that every cell needs them. I, got, I said, oh my God, if we could make oils with health in mind, and we could bring back the missing omega-3s, we could help so many people and it was like i finally found a purpose for my life i finally found something that's big enough to be worth doing is literally it's it was like that and uh i like to say i had an orgasm and <laughs> i i got so inspired i got so inspired and i've been basically living in that now i now i have a, even a bigger project which is that eight billion people could live their lives lit up from within because the light is already inside of every human being. It's called life, energy. That light, and you can see it if you can bring your awareness inside. That life is already inside of every human being. It's just a matter of looking into that light instead of away from it, which is what we mostly do. When we get in touch with that light, we will feel so cared for because life loves 
every human being unconditionally from within. Not only is it unconditionally loving, but also omnipresent, so everywhere present in your body, omnipotent, all power in your body, and omniscient, knows everything in your body. That is the definition of God. So God lives inside of you, and not just as a theory, but in fact, in practice, as life energy and awareness. And so when we feel cared for, because we are, then we don't feel like we need more, and then we stop stealing other people's stuff. When we stop stealing other people's stuff, we can live in harmony together. And when we live in harmony together, we can make sure that everybody's basic needs are met on a long-term sustainable basis. And as human beings, we are wired for this. We have always been wired for this. It's just when we don't spend enough time looking inside into the wiring to get that that is actually our nature. And so what we do instead is we you know, we look only on the outside and then we always live in reaction to change. And your power comes from when you get in touch with your power inside and you manifest that into the world. You know, power to, not power over, but power to. Do you have the power to create a, a world that reflects your knowledge of yourself? Because your state of being comes to expression, whatever that is. If you're angry, you, you put out a different energy than if you're afraid. And when if you're afraid, you put out a different energy and if you're act, than if you're anxious. And if you're in love, you put out a different energy than again. And if you feel whole and cared for and loved, you your state of being will be different again. So whatever is our state of being be automatically comes to expression. So the question then becomes is, what is the best state of being for a human being to be in? And the answer to that question is in an experience of your own nature. That requires, maybe it requires uh, to taking a few minutes or maybe more than a few few minutes to sit still and just breathe and just see how still you can become and see how deep you can go into the stillness within you and then in that stillness see how long you can stay there and in staying there See what you can discover. Discover what there is to discover within you of yourself. And when you do that, it takes, takes time to get really good at it. But when you do that, when you get good at it, you will discover that you are, whether no matter what anybody's ever said about you or what you've said to yourself, you are a magnificent being. And that magnificence is an experience that every human being has built in, but not so many, not nearly enough people actually go in and dig it out. And that's, I call that the homework. So that was a, that was a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it was a good one indeed enough for a buffet. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, or maybe that was the dessert. <laughs> hey that's that's beautiful too because there's a thought of having dessert first before the full yeah yeah of course <laughs> yeah exactly life is uncertain so eat dessert first <laughs> yes indeed yes indeed it is so sweet and so many things to unpack with that especially yeah. the power to as opposed to the power over and mm -hmm. tapping into yourself and heck even over these past but most folks of me have had that time to do that depending on yes. the situation some right. folks may have and some folks probably didn't because they were afraid to dive in so right right i think i think corona i think the lockdown 
due to Corona is kind of like the human race got a, a time out and it opened up the space that people could do all the things they claim they've always wanted to do, but never had the time for because <laughs> we got put on, because <laughs> everything got put on hold. Right. I, and I was just thinking about this. I, I just wrote something down. It's like, if you're addicted to your thoughts, to your things and to your habits, then probably in this lockdown, this mandatory lockdown, you probably might have experienced some withdrawal symptoms from that addiction. And, and it, would be, uh, it would be fair to say that if you, if you had a problem with it, you b basically got to see how serious your addiction is to your thoughts, your habits. Uh, and, and, and it's good to know that you're that addicted because the truth is, something in you is whole and if you had to sit down for another three months and do nothing and you could sit in your own wholeness you would feel unbelievably beautiful and you'd be grateful for the time that you've been the time that has been forced on you that you can use to discover more of how how magnificent it is to be a human being Ah, uh, yes, and how magnificent it is to definitely be a human being. And the beautiful thing about it is, is that a, a lot of people don't really realize how magnificent it is. And a lot of folks from time to time don't even watch their intake, which is kind of like what you do. Is actually, That's actually what you do, actually help people realize, you know what, they got to optimize their intakes. That way they can truly realize their power to actually help more people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because the only thing, if you think about it, the only thing that's not working on this planet is destructive ways in which we think. So we, you know, we imagine enemies into being, and then we pretend that our imagining is real, and then we start to treat them like enemies. Just an example, right? If you, if you imagined friends into being, that would work too. And with, and, and our imagining enemies out of being comes out of a long history of living in, a, in an environment where there were predators and it wasn't safe and we hadn't built all the safety that we have now and all of the, you know, like our shelters, our, our clothes, you know, our weapons, all of, the, all of the stuff that we've created. We imagine them into being as well. And now we're in a place where we have the safety, but we're still thinking like cavemen. We could be thinking like masters and we're thinking like cavemen. And so because, because we're addicted to those thought cycles and they, those thought cycles carry through cultures and carry through uh, you know, centuries, we actually have belief systems that work very good when they were or originated and are completely insane right now. And so looking at those, you know, again, if you, if you, if you get present in your own being, then you discover that most of the thoughts, a lot of the thoughts that you have are not helpful. Cooperation has always worked better than competition you know, helping each other with what we have to what we need has always worked better than beating people up to try and steal their stuff because they, put, you know, because they put up resistance. Why are we still doing that? That's a really good question. <laughs> so we're, we're, we're not under, we, we're not forced to do that, but we're still doing it. Ah, oh, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And, and that's where the homework comes in. What is the homework? The homework is the work you do at home within your own being to lighten up because the light's already there to lighten up, to, to find your wholeness, which is built into you, to find your contentment, to find your peace. This peace has biological roots. Peace is not absence of war. 
peace has biological roots within something within every human being is completely in peace. And that peace is extremely good for health and extremely good for creativity and extremely good for positivity. But you have to go where it is to discover that. And so that's always the, the recommendation is always do your homework. <laughs> no, only, we're not saying it like beat you up if you don't do your homework. This is an invitation, an invitation to do homework. If you have, if you live a really busy life, then on the toilet, when you're on the toilet, you don't have to think about what's going on there. You can just <laughs> breathe in and breathe out. And while, you know, so you can do that and, it is possible to live in peace in the middle of your day's activities, but it takes practice to be able to stay in peace and do your work at the same time. It's called simultaneous presence. And that's where the masters lived. That's where the, that's where the people who had the best lives lived because they were fully present in their own being, in their own nature and fully present in their environment at the same time, not lost in thoughts in their head and living their lives by formulas, but responding into the needs of situations. There we go, responding to the need indeed. Definitely gotta to respond to the need. And heck, even doing the true homework and not worrying about being that one little kid that got beat up because he reminded the teachers like hey what about that homework assignment <laughs> yeah this is homework you impose on yourself because there's really something amazing to discover from doing that homework but you can't discover it without doing the homework but it's already there you know it's like digging for gold the gold is already there but you still got to do the digging you know, even so people say to you, well, you're, you're not nice or you're, you don't belong or nobody loves you or you're ugly or, you know, all the things that people have said, it's never been true. They just made that shit up, you know, out of their own, out of their own discontent, right? Or because they had an agenda for you, but life has never said anything to you except I love you. I care for you. I will make you hungry when it's time to eat. I will make you tired when it's time to sleep. You know, setting it up so that we have a good life. You get the sleep, we get the sleep we need. We get the food we, we need, make you thirsty when you need water, make you feel like taking a shower when, when you feel sweated up and sticky in summer. You know, every, and, and it's built in. The needs... You know, life put in us signals that tell us when it's time to do the things we need to do, the simple stuff. And yeah, you know, I, I, was, I was born in a war. So we were refugees when I was not yet three. And we were fleeing from the communists who were chasing us in tanks and trucks. And the allies were using us as target practice. And there were only like women and children and in horse-drawn hay wagons or, or yeah, basically horse-drawn hay wagons. And there were no soldiers on those roads. So they were shooting at the refugees who were trying to flee from the war from the, out of the, out of like Poland in, you know, westward. And they were, they were shooting at them from planes. And it was really chaotic. I, I don't remember a lot, but it was just like, I couldn't trust anything. I didn't know what I could depend on. It was chaotic. So I got into trying to find out how the world works through science, studying science later on, and then through biological sciences later on, and then through psychology later on, how thinking works. So how things work, how creatures work, how thinking works. And then I ended up with self-knowledge because I needed to know how I work. And so this, the insights that I'm sharing with you come out of that homework, come out of looking, come, come out of really wanting to know. Because when I was six years old, you know, I said, God, there must be a better way to live than this. People were arguing about really stupid little things. 
and I, I listen to yet another st stupid argument among adults. And I was like, there has to be a, a way to, that people can live in harmony. And I'm going to find out how. That's been my driver. I'm going to find out how people can live in harmony. And, it's, and like I said before, it's, we are wired for living like that. Beautiful right there, indeed. And it's so true, we are wired for that. And yeah. a lot of folks let their wires get tangled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's mostly we ignore the wiring. You know, our senses take us out into the world. That's important for survival. Was important for survival, not so much, but... So our senses take us out into the world. And in the process of going out into the world through our senses, we disconnect it from the core of our own being. So we started when we were in my, our mother's womb. I call it the Buddha tank, because there was nothing to do, nowhere to go. Everything was taken care of, and it was safe, relatively. And so we just hung out there. And our awareness was at rest in its source, inside, in life. So present inside, absent outside in our awareness. When we came out, of the, out into the world after, after we were born, our senses took our awareness out into the world because we have to get to know the world. And then we got disconnected from our being and ended up going from being present inside and absent outside to being present outside, but absent inside. And that's where heartache began. That's where heartache began. Your disconnection, I, my disconnection from myself is where heartache began for me. And we have lots of names for it. Sometimes we call it blues, loneliness, longing, yearning, wanting, needing, restlessness, emptiness. Uh, if somebody, if we lose one of our outside distractions, grief, sorrow, feeling of loss, uh, so many different words. I have 10 pages of different words that people use for it. I call it the thirst of the heart. Heartache is my heart calling my awareness to come back home and reconnect to life. But mostly we don't get told that. But every time your heart aches, you know, like, you know, somebody dumped you in a, in a relationship, your heart aches. You know, somebody close to you dies, your heart aches. You know, so your expectations are not fulfilled, your heart aches. And it got, every time we lose something that we've used as a substitute for being present in our own life, we feel that ache that is our heart calling our awareness to come back home to the wholeness of our life. And when we come home, the heartache goes away. Now, we usually distract ourselves from it. We'll do anything to distract ourselves from it. I say to people, sit with your heartache, feel it. Don't judge it, just feel it. It is a, the greatest gift you've been given other than being alive. Because if it wasn't for that heartache, you would never find your way back home to yourself. And it will be there and it will remind you to come back home every time that you lose something or every time that you get disconnected again because you get distracted. It will remind you and it will do that lifelong until you come home. But most people don't know that that's what heartache is about. They think it's about the, the woman who dumped me or the man who dumped me or, or, or the promise that was broken. No, it's just when those things happen that we relied on, then we're back to our own loss of ourself that happened early on and that is a natural part of the human journey. So heartache is the, is the greatest gift that you've been given other than being alive. So if you sit with it and you feel it, it's not going to hurt you. It's not going to kill you. So you can actually sit with the heartache and feel it and not even a hair's breadth deeper than that is your wholeness. So you're so close when you have heartache, you're so close, so close to your heart being full 
you know, empty heart to, to full heart, so close. And nothing has to happen on the outside. Only your awareness has to move to the inside in order to get that. Imagine eight people, eight billion people doing that. So we have a very different planet. Ah, uh, amen indeed, amen indeed. That's the light we all truly need right there. Mm -hmm. And that's actually the first time I ever heard heartache explained that way. And it's so darn true because if we were allowed ourselves to be completely numb from that, <laughs> then we wouldn't right. know how to find our way back. Right. If you distract yourself, you won't find your way back. You have to, it's kind of like hunger. If you never felt hungry, you might actually starve to death because you would never know when to stop and eat. Right. Or right. if you, if you didn't know when to go to the bathroom, you know, you might actually blow up your bladder. Right. <laughs> because you fill it and 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 you never go until something, you know, but life gave us the feelings that tell us when we need to pay attention to something. So pay attention to the feeling, sit with the feeling, breathe into the feeling, accept it as a gift and slip behind it into your wholeness, into your magnificence, into your, into your awesomeness. That's the undone homework. <laughs> around the world <laughs> doesn't matter where you go the undone homework that's the undone homework <laughs> and it's, that's the thing for the show undone homework at this point right <laughs> yeah and the and and the undone homework is this conversation is the most important not had conversation on the planet because there's no culture that that systematically makes makes it clear to people what that is and helps them sit with it, acknowledge it, embrace it, appreciate it for the power it has to bring us back home to the beauty of our own existence. Woo, my man's filling up the necklace full of jewels, baby. That's right, the jewels of wisdom. <laughs> Yeah. And it doesn't matter, you know, it's, it's, it is independent. That journey is the human journey. It doesn't matter what race you're from, which gender you are, how old you are, what culture you're from, what religion you have, uh, what nation you live in. This is the human journey. This is the, like the completion. You want the full, the full enchilada of the human journey. You have to do that homework. And, uh, the, and the payoff in terms of how good you feel about living and enjoying life, there is nothing that gets you a greater payoff than coming home to yourself. And yet when you feel, when you feel comfortable, guess what? You're going to take better care of yourself because you're actually enjoying being here. You're going to be uh, your relationships are going to be more fun because you can actually play when you feel whole. You won't, you won't be trying to get your partner to fulfill you because they can't because your fulfillment already lives within you. And uh, if you haven't done your homework, it's not fair to, to try to force somebody else to do your homework for you. And your, your, your relationships with people generally are going to be more more upbeat and more comfortable and more and happier because you, you're not pushing it. You don't have to push and pull them because you already got what you need. You're living in what you, in what you need most. You already have that. And then the transactions become much easier. You're not putting burdens on other people that are impossible for them to, to carry because they're your burdens. They only shape for you. Your burden is only your shape. If you put it on somebody else, they can't carry it. And then, and then in terms of the work you do, it'll be easier because you won't be doing the work because you think it's going to fulfill you. You're going to do the work because it needs to be done. So it's very, it changes it. You, when, you're, when you don't feel whole, then, and I keep saying you, I, I should really say we or me because 
I'm talking from my own experience. When I did not feel fulfilled, I was always looking for what can I do that'll fulfill me. And I wouldn't do things that needed to be done because I couldn't see how they would fulfill me. And when I learned how to sit still and, and do that homework, I realized, oh my God, I'm taken care of. Okay, so it doesn't have to be about me anymore. And not, then it was, okay, what needs to be done around here? Where can I help? What do I have talent for? What do I have experience in? And what are the biggest needs in my sphere of influence? And let me address those because I want to make the biggest splash for good that I can make in the time that I have for as many people as I can. Whatever way. And there's a thousand ways to help. But I have to get over myself first. Because, you know, because until I, until I feel whole, then I'm always going to be helping myself. And that's where greed comes from. And that's where, that's where all the, all the n nasty transactions come from. You know, pe because people don't recognize nobody else can fulfill you. You are already fulfilled. It's kind of like you have a dollar in your pocket. It's in your left pocket. But you're not going to look in your left pocket. You're only going to look in your right pocket. And then you look in your right pocket and say, I'm broke, I'm broke, I'm broke. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. You want to know how much money you got? You got, to get, you got to put your hand in the pocket where the money is. And in a way, it's the same thing. We're looking outside, you know, no, that's not working. Oh, no, that's, oh, that's disappointing. Oh, no, that's not getting me taken care of. Oh, no, not that either. Not that person either. Oh, I really don't like that person. And maybe if I can hurt them, I can get them out of my way. And then I'll be happier. And it's all BS. Because your unhappiness doesn't come from another person. Your unhappiness comes from my own disconnection from myself. And any time in any situation, I can move my awareness inward. And I can move my awareness outward. When I move it inward, I feel taken care of. When I move it, move it outward, I disconnect from myself. Unless I know how to stay connected and also do what I need to do. Very, it's, this is like, this is deeper than psychology. Ah, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. That's right. So darn deep, you got to have five shovels, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yes, indeed. He's definitely dropping that heat, or should I say he's brightening us up? That's right. That's right, lighting us up indeed. Lighting yeah, us up just, indeed. well, I'm pointing at the light that will lighten you up. Right? Ah, uh, touche. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 you have to, the, light, the light's already there. But I can't lighten you up. You need to discover that you're already lit up. Just because you're alive. Life is the light. Life is the light. Life is the master. Life is, is the goodies, you know. Your best goodies you already have. You were born loaded with those goodies. Born with it. Have always had it. Will always have it. And you can pay attention to it or you can ignore it. The, when you pay attention to it, you end up with a better life. Uh, that sounds like an inspirational blog or video. You were born loaded. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Born loaded. Born loaded. <laughs> He's writing that one down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But hey, it's yeah. definitely good to write that one down because it's so true. And I forgot where it was somewhere recently read where, how we seem to get it at like the two ends of life, usually at birth and closer to death. And, in between is where we sometimes get it a lot more wrong than we should. Right. That's yeah, very true. Um, uh, kids, when they're young, they're still pretty close to it because they were in that state before they were born. So they tend to be, that's why we like kids so much because they're really fun. They're direct and they're fun and they laugh easily and they cry easily and they're full of adventure and they're light up and, 
and when people are have done their life and they're thinking about their exit, uh, sometimes they become pretty philosophical too. They realize that all the things we put so much importance in in the world may not be as important as we make them. Obviously, you have to do some things, but but what if? You know, because the other way to look at it is you, at, at one point, you didn't exist for like millions of years. You never existed. And now you get 100 years if you're lucky. And then after that, you will never exist again as you, as the person you are. And in between those two, which is only, which in, you know, out of billions of years is, is like 100, 100 years. In that time that you have, you have choices about how you want that that hundred year journey to be. From you know, from deeply depressed to ecstatic, anywhere along that continuum, from deeply depressed, bummed out to oh my god, how incredible. And then you invest time in deciding where, where on that, where on that line you want to be. Uh, definitely want to be on the line where it matters the most. <laughs> yeah, I, I, we, I think we are. I think there's something attractive about light. I think chasing light is more fulfilling than chasing darkness. Oh yeah, because in the darkness you can't see nothing. <laughs> yeah, for instance. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But then you but then you are the light. You are the light in within your own being. You. You know, I you know, I, I, I'll go back to what I said at the beginning. If somebody, if I point, if somebody points at you and says, whose body is that? You say, it's my body. So you just told me that you're not the body and you know it, but you haven't thought about what you said. Mm. Right. But you're saying, I'm not the body. I'm the owner. If it's my body, I'm the owner. Well, then who are you? Well, who owns the body? Life owns the body. The energy that animates your body is who you are. How well do you know yourself? Maybe not a bad idea to get to know yourself. And then at the other end, you know, they say, oh, you know, people say, um, you know, say if, they've, if they've been to a, um, you know, a place where somebody close to them died, a family member died, an aunt or a grandmother or something. And, they, and you often hear them say, well, I saw the body but auntie wasn't there anymore, or grandma wasn't there anymore, or grandpa wasn't there anymore. So they're, they're actually saying, look, grandma, grandma, grandpa, auntie was not the body, but was whatever it was that left the body. When the person, you know, when, the, when, when life separates from the body, the body's finished. You know, and so then they talk about, well, he left his body. So we actually know, even in our language, we know that we are not the body, but we are the life in the body. And when we get that we are, we are life, and life chose us to have the body we have, to be what we are, because we could have been a dandelion, you know, and we could have been, a, you know, a... a an E. coli bacteria, or we could have been a tree. But life chose us to be a human being. So every human being on the planet was chosen, and every plant and animal and every creature on the, on the planet was chosen. You know, we, we, we often think of, this is what we talked about before we got on air, right? People think about, oh, well, we're the chosen people. You know, God chose us in, in, like, the Jews were the chosen people, and the Germans thought they were better than everybody else, and the Italians thought they were the chosen people. 
and you can go around the world in different cultures. We're the chosen people. We're the chosen people. We're the chosen people. We're the chosen people. That's according to the culture. That's according to the, the stuff they learned and memorized. But that's not according to life because life chose everybody. Life chose them male and female. Life chose them black and white. Life chose them every color and hue in between. Life chose them in Africa and in America, in, in Asia and in Australia. You know, every living creature was chosen by life to be alive and is unconditionally loved by life for a lifetime. Now, I, that's, that's nice to hear it said, but what if that was your experience because you actually spent time sitting down and getting in touch with that experience within yourself? And how would that be different? All of a sudden, I don't have any enemies anymore. In that place, there are no enemies. There are only chosen people. We're all, we're all part of what was chosen on the surface of this planet to, to be alive for a time. Ah, uh, yes, indeed. It's a different way of, it's a different way of looking at, you know, it's like, this is not political and this is not religious. This is not, this is basically, this is biological. Bio means life. Biology is the study of life. When you look at, everything from life's perspective it's quite different from what what you've been taught we've been taught i've been taught you know because i wasn't taught this what most of what i'm talking about now comes from my experience of at starting at 30 years old starting to do my homework and so i do do spend time checking in every day and all my insights come from that because all, all the insights, where do you want to go if you want to know how to live? Why wouldn't you ask life, <laughs> right? <laughs> Instead, you, why would you go to an expert on the outside when, you, when the master of life lives inside of you? Why wouldn't you just turn in and ask life, how should I live? Show me, you know, if you don't know, say, I don't know, please show me. And all the answers are inside every human being for their life. And then if you ask, if you, if you find like maybe Einstein was pretty genius and maybe, maybe you've met some people that have pretty good expert advice to give, where do you think they go for it? They didn't, you know, if, if it was, if it's really original stuff, they didn't memorize it from a book. You know, they didn't have it, have it hammered into their head by a teacher. If it, because if, because, if it's original, it wasn't available to other people, to people. So they had to go somewhere for it. Well, where do you go for it? Well, you have to go inside for it because that's where it comes from. Einstein said, uh, Einstein said, uh, he said a thousand times I think and think and think and I get nothing. And then one time I get quiet and float in silence and the answer comes to me. So even those guys, even those guys are like a, scientist right was actually getting his answers not from himself and not from his 200 iq but from just getting quiet and just being being instead of doing you know we we're supposed to be human beings we become human doings but being is actually more important than doing because you can be without doing, but you can't do without being. So if being is the foundation of doing, maybe, maybe paying attention to the foundation might be a worthwhile idea. And, we, and by heartache, life invites us to explore being. So this is, this is the ne neglected area and we've become pretty good at learning skills. That's a good thing to do. You know, the skills, the skills maybe put the, you know, get you the, the bread on your table and the, the roof on your, over your head and the diaper changes for your kids. 
but the skills, but, but none of those things give you the fullness of heart that would be nice to model to your kids. For that, you don't go to the skill. For that, you go, go to the being. And so then you can... Anyway, I could go on and on and on. <laughs> I, I, I should probably shut up and let, let, let you talk. Hey, it's all good. It is all good. It's, I feel like one of those young students in a martial arts dojo and the, the black mm -hmm. belt masters really tell us some good stories that prove a point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, the only difference is uh, nobody gets to scrape their knuckles in what I'm doing. <laughs> I'll break their bones or get, the, get their nose broken or anything. <laughs> well, I guess in a way they could get broken in a way psychologically depending on what they no, do no. <laughs> yeah yeah we're yeah we're breaking we're breaking some concepts i think <laughs> and that's a good thing yeah oh uh, yes indeed good with five o's even it's extra good so if the, is there a question that you wish you would be asked more often when you're being interviewed like this is there something that no no because I actually like interviews i like interviews more than monologues and simply because the people doing the interviews know their audiences better than i do and so of course i didn't do that here uh, but but generally speaking i like to just speak into whatever the audience's need might be and the host often knows that better than i do because i you know because i'm just me and i i do what I do and I know what I know and I say what I say. But audiences have angles. You know, certain audiences have different issues. So it's always better to be asked. So in, in, in terms of answering your question, to be asked the questions your audience that would most help your audience. But I don't know what that question would be. <laughs> right? Because my... Because my goal in life is I want to help as many people in as many ways as I can to have a life that is better than the one they would have without my input. That's all I'm good for. I, I don't need anything else. Makes perfect sense. It kind of goes back to the point where you're talking about how you're pointing people towards the light. You're not giving them the light. Right. You can't. You already got the light. You already. You already are the light. Actually. Oh yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Because you already talked about more very powerful things, especially in the mental health category. Because that's some of the things that folks tend to deal with now more mm -hmm. than ever. And just sitting still and doing that inner work is really important. There is no mental illness in the light that you are. And there is no mental illness in the awareness that you are. When you disconnect from those, then you can get tied up in thoughts and then have ruminating thoughts and recurring thoughts and anxious thoughts and all of that. But it comes out of being discontent. So, uh, you know, you could, it would be possible for a person to be physically completely wrecked and the body on its way out and mentally completely disorganized and socially completely dysfunctional in an environment that was a disaster area and they would still be within that person and this is like all eight billion of us inside of each one of us even in the midst of that there is still an energy that is not affected by any of that stuff and an awareness that is not affected by any of that stuff. So you are whole in the core of your being, no matter what's going on with your body, your mind, your, your uh, social group, or your environment. That's powerful. That's how powerful it is. So you always have the possibility of finding that wholeness no matter what is going on at any stage in life under any circumstances. What a design. What, a, what an amazing design. 
that that would be even possible because it could have been could have been put together that all you did was ever all you ever did was suffer and hurt and bleed and you know and there was no recourse but every human being has a recourse and they carry that recourse with them wherever they go i think that i think that's like genius not my genius life's genius the creator's genius the universe's genius to design it that way ah uh, yes that divine design yes indeed yes indeed that divine design so speaking of divine design and all of the magical homework that started at 30 if you're to wake up tomorrow and you're 25 again but this time in 2020 with all of your amassed completed homework assignments what advice would you give to yourself I, I, then i would start at six <laughs> <laughs> if i knew then what i knew now i would have started earlier but you get yeah but you can't do it that way right because you are where you are all i'm what i'm saying is whatever your age is whatever your situation is whatever you've been through whatever your history is there's something in you is that's worth getting to know get to know it and when should you start well tony robbins would say when is now a good time to start <laughs> when is now a good time to start so he puts the answer into the question right you know as soon as you know there's you know it's like this is like a uh, uh, it's like a message of possibility. I was very lucky that somebody introduced me to this possibility. It wasn't my parents, and it wasn't the war I was born in, and it wasn't in Europe. I was 30 when I heard the message. And I was like, and at that point, I was already looking for something. I, I said, you know, there's more going on. I know there's a perfection within me. I know I'm not connected to it. I need to find somebody who can show me a step. The next day, somebody, uh, I heard about somebody who subsequently showed me a step. You know, the question, but you don't need to search for it outside because you need to start looking inside because it's inside of you. The answer you're looking for on the outside. I didn't know it then, but I know it now. That's why I can tell you, right? I did not know then that the answer I was looking for was not in my head because I did a lot of thinking. I was like, eh. Not, that was not very rewarding and isn't it was not outside me it was always within me it was always there i just had never heard that you could find a way to bring your awareness inside and enjoy it and so whenever you know when you hear about it it's a good time to start anyway it's something to get you thinking to, to think about so much more is possible you know and uh, you're probably not going to get it on the evening news. <laughs> you could probably say that 10 times over because it's so true. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's do it. You're not going to get it on the evening news. You're not going to get it on the evening news. You're not going to get it on the evening news. <laughs> right? Because they, they, deal, they always deal with what's wrong. And what, you, what, what we do best at is when we find out what's right. And what's right is already within us running the show with great love. Ah, oh, yes, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. The power of love. Power of love. Heck, that actually reminded me of one of your stories on one of your, on your Facebook page when you were in the class that day and the professor asked, how did your parents show you love? And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know that was funny. So yeah, we, because I, I came from Europe in Europe, we shook hands. We didn't hug. This is like in Germany after the, after the war, I don't know what they did before, but uh, hugging is, was not as big a thing in Europe. It says it was a very, maybe North American thing. So we came to North America, my parents shook hands and I watched people hug and I said, Oh, I guess my parents don't love me. <laughs> and, uh, and then when I was taking my master's degree in counseling psychology, so I was in my 40s by that time, and, and, and the, the uh, professor said, uh, so how did your parents show love? And I said, well, they didn't. And then he didn't say anything for a few minutes. 
for a few seconds and he said, uh, you didn't answer my question. And usually I'm a pretty good listener. So I thought, hmm. So I said, ask me again. I thought I answered your question because I thought I heard your question. He said, how did your parents show love? And I said it a little bit slower. I said, they didn't. So he waited again and he said, you didn't answer my question. How did your parents show love? And all of a sudden it occurred to me, oh yeah, when my father was, was pleased, he would bump me with his shoulder. And when my mother was pleased, there would be a twinkle in his eyes and it was unmistakable. And then he said, so I said, so I said that. So he said, thank you. And he wouldn't let me get away with the notion that my parents didn't love me. And of course, now I know, yeah, that's right. If my parents didn't love me, they could have cooked and eaten me. <laughs> right? But they didn't. You know, they made sure we had clothes. They made sure we had water. They made sure we had food. You know, they, they, you know, they, they were pretty intense sometimes, but then that's just because <laughs> they had rules that we, they wanted us to follow that they felt were good rules. But to, to say that, you know, and they, and you may not have liked the way they treated you and mine used to whack me. My, my father especially used to whack me quite a bit, but I was always getting into shit too. too you know? so, <laughs> so, so looking back at it, I say, yeah, I was, I was a handful, right? I was a serious handful. And so, so the idea that your parents don't love you, even if they, don't treat you like the prince you'd like to be or the princess you'd like to be. They're doing the best they can with what they have, with what they know, with what they've learned in order to try and make you able to live effectively on this planet. So the idea that my parents didn't love me is like, I look at it and I say, what was I thinking? <laughs> what <laughs> was I thinking? <laughs> Anyway, so he, he and the professor would not let me get away with the notion that my parents didn't love me. It was like, that's absolutely that. And it's like, he didn't say you're wrong, but he just, he just like pushed me. He, he was not willing to accept me. He wouldn't let me get away with that stupid idea. So I'm very grateful for, <laughs> for it. Yeah, good. Yeah, it was a good story. Heck yeah, it was. I'm like, man, that is powerful right there. It's like it, it yeah. shows the power of words too. It's like the how part. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So for those folks who want to definitely know how to get in contact with you and of course, check out all of your wonderful products on your site, what's the best way for folks to reach out to you? Uh, there's a couple of websites. One is uh, udoschoice.com. That's where the products are. Flax oil, the, the oils that I developed and, and I developed enzymes and probiotics and some other products that are good for health. The educational stuff is on another website. It's called theudo.com. T-H-E-U-D-O. Udo is my name. T H E the udo.com. And there's all kinds of stuff on it. Uh, the book, the, the book on total sexy health, the eight key parts designed by nature is on it. There's a book on it called fats that heal fats that kill. And then there's all kinds of videos and we do some courses. And, um, yeah. And I'm on Facebook and on easy to find on Facebook and, uh, and what else? Instagram and I'm on LinkedIn. Yeah, I'm not hard to find. If you just write in UDO, you'll, you'll find me along with a couple of other guys whose name is also Udo, but there's not too many Udos around. So Udo Erasmus. And uh, yeah, I've got, well, I've got a YouTube channel too. Udo Erasmus. So there's lots, lots. But more important than finding me is finding yourself. If, if there's any way I can help you with that, I'm always happy to do that. I hope, I hope this is uh, helpful. Oh, uh, yes, indeed. With a capital H and D definitely helpful right there. Definitely helpful. right. Did there. you say yes, indeed. With a capital H? Yes. 
<laughs> okay, that's a good one. <laughs> yes, indeed, with a capital H. Okay. <laughs> You're funny, Dom. <laughs> Sweet. I'm glad the practice is working out. That's good. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, definitely, folks, check out the show notes to all of Udo's wonderful goods, the wonderful books and programs, and all of his products, indeed. And to get more of his wisdom, check out all of his other wares, too. My man's been around the internet globe, and he's got massive amounts of content that you can dive into to help you dive within yourself more often than you need to. Yes, indeed. <laughs> so, any parting words for the folks still listening? Yeah. Make it a good one. Choose to make it a good one. And do your homework. <laughs> Before supper. <laughs> How's it going, you super special awesome human? Since you made it to the end of this episode, it looks like you really enjoyed yourself. Since you enjoyed this episode, be sure to share it with at least three people in your network and tell them what you really liked about this episode. Heck, even shoot myself or the guests an email and let them know what you liked most about this interview so that way they can stay inspired to keep pushing out great work.